Mike the Ref Maloney, Big Bad Boris on the call here tonight. It's oh, super kick. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Third. Let's go. Super kick party. Yeah, pay the money for that. No one. And of course, you got to get the coffins. <laughs> Hey, yo, 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 and away we go. Happy Wednesday night for one and all here. Yeah, we're here a little early today. Well, I'm on holidays. I had a full day off today, so I thought, what the hell? I know you guys are looking for a lot of my thoughts on the uh, McMahon documentary here. So I thought, you know what? I'll watch it. And I got some notes here. They're on my prompter. So at least I can use my prompter for saying I'm supposed to for the next uh, little bit here. So um yeah so we're gonna go through it here uh i will warn everybody who's watching right now this does deal with um sexual assault and other uh, the easiest way just to put it is deplorable stuff so just i'm gonna try and skirt around it as much as i can without actually getting into too many details uh i do want i do encourage you to go out and watch this uh bait there's some parts I think some wrestling fans can skip and some that can watch some that are pretty much a must watch. So, uh, Hey, makeshift money. Good to see you here. Uh, I am gonna, if you guys have thoughts, if you have watched it already, please feel free to add in, uh, any thoughts and feelings that you have as we go along here. Uh, we're probably going to take about half an hour to do this here as we get ready for a W grand slam at the top of the hour. But yeah, like I said, I want to do this and it's probably going to go up as a separate video on YouTube. So with that being said, let's get into this because uh, it let's just say it wasn't the easiest watch in the world watching this. A lot of it got for, for somebody who's an experienced wrestling fan. It got a little boring in the middle. Like, you know, a lot of the stuff that's happening. I consider the, the Vince McMahon documentary essentially to me comes down to three parts i think it could have been a little more salacious if they would have waited six months a year now that this investigation is going on i almost feel like it might have been a good idea to hold off on this to finish that last chapter of the story once the legal procedures have gone through because it looked like the uh director and Everyone was trying to bring up those details, but not bring them up to the point where they uh, they could be sued for, you know, fake news or whatever, uh, for slander or whatnot, if the court doesn't find anything or any results don't find anything. I, I think there's sort of a issue. That's what I got the vibe of. And there is actually a point in this uh, documentary where you could tell that it went from pre pre um, pre charges to post charges in terms of the editing of the show. So makeshift. That's my biggest question. Are punches pulled in it or do they really press Vince? If it's coming up in your notes, does, okay. Well, I, I will say this: there is there are shots fired. There are definitely shots fired in here, and we're going to get into those right away here. Did they go full bore on the current stuff? No, they can't. Because like I said, if everything is proven innocent in court, this documentary and the directors and the producers and all that could be um, sued for slander and whatnot. If he's found guilty, which be, my own personal opinion, he's going to get nailed. He's either going to get nailed with a guilty charge or he's going to die, whichever one comes first. But... If he's not, it's all about covering your butts these days. And it's sort of the work of a pro, uh, a promoter. And it actually sort of fits in uh, to our review here of how it's going here. So let's get into this here. As, so this was broken down into six, six parts. Each one was between 50 minutes and an hour 10. I feel there were three real sections of the show that uh, you can get into and get around. And the first one starts out. Uh, 
they were talking about how important the wrestling business is in today's culture and just the effect that Vince McMahon has had on it to be one of the top, like he is essentially the face of wrestling to the common person these days. Uh, they were talking about the beginnings of Vince McMahon and Vincent J. McMahon and how the territory system worked. They talked about the dismantling of the territory system. Fun fact, I learned, I didn't know this before. The reason Vince McMahon actually started in is commentating and why he's so poor at it. The only reason he was commentating is because the guy who was doing the commentating was having a pay dispute with Vince Sr. And Vince Sr. was apparently played with a roll of quarters in his hand, which be as it may, a poker player at the best. Uh, he actually looked at Vince and he's like, yeah, Vince, you're doing it. I'm not paying this guy. And that's how we got Vince McMahon on commentary. So, Carney's gonna Carney. What can I say here? But as we move on here, uh, they start talking about the transition into uh, Vincent J to Vincent K. So from senior to junior, uh, and the actual deal was not a full blown sale. It was more of a a pay to own kind of deal. He was going to pay him back with the profits from the company. Vince Jr. to Vince Sr. And then Vince uh, had to start working on dismantling the territory system by, you know, plucking the best talents from across the country and going into other territories and basically talked a little bit about how he had to find a way to shove his dad out of the business. We'll get back to that one a little later on here. And then from there, you... You go through it, and he he was talking about Bob Backlund being the uh, the face of Vincent K, uh, J McMahon at uh, WWF, and he had to decide on who he wanted. He saw a guy like Dusty, but he didn't feel that he had enough charisma and whatnot to take that mantle. To which they showed a picture of Cody and. He was trying to be very diplomatic about his answer about that. So I, I commend him on his diplomacy. Which naturally that moved into the story of Hulkamania. The fact that they were bringing up the Sheik. And the way they were doing the Sheik. Everything just worked out perfectly for the fact that. Um, all the stuff happening in Iraq at the time. And the Iran war. And uh, every, all that stuff just perfectly played into the fact that the Sheik became the champ. Move everything over to Hogan. And then moved on from there but as he was starting to grow they were talking they ended up talking about a little bit about the uh, criticism that was coming up with uh, Je uh john stossel and uh, matthew bells are those two interviews that are for old-time wrestling fans they are pretty famous uh they are uh one was a reporter one was a host and they were both determined to show how fake wrestling was which we all know today, rest, saying those words are still uh, rather blasé, passé, not not perfect. But they showed they showed the video of uh, David Schultz slapping uh, Stossel, and then Belzer getting choked out by Hogan, which caused a whole bunch of controversy as well. And for every time. It, it, it seemed like they were not able... They were able to get a certain level, but as long as they were able to con control the situation, everything was perfect. But when it was outside their sort of area, they started having a problem here. We'll get back to that one. Then they started talking about the idea of WrestleMania and how it, it came up as an idea... Vince says it com came up as an idea after a two-day vacation that uh, Linda forced him on. I don't know the semblance of... Well, the WrestleMania name came from Howard Finkel. I think we... Uh, that's one thing we do know is all adjusted and thematically removed from this thing. So so he talked about Mania and how successful it was. And then just as we're getting to the end of episode one, we uh, got a preview of the what was about to come here in p part two with the uh, steroid scan scandal. So all in all, the first one here is a very old school introduction to everything. So I think most wrestling fans that are newer, they can sort of uh, step back and say, 
you know, maybe you should, uh, maybe you should take a look at this and see how, see how things were to start off and how the, everything began more about his personal life is going to come later on in the store later on in the documentary here, but it moved on to episode two, which gets you a little bit more about the thought of the eighties, what they were doing, what everything was doing and uh, how everything went down here. So uh, right off the bat, they talk about one of the bis- biggest successes in the 80s in episode two, which is uh, the introduction of Saturday Night's main event, which uh, we had Bob Costas come in here and start uh, giving his thoughts about everything going on here. And they were talking about how getting on network television was one of the biggest boons for WWE, period. As you're going through this, you're not seeing a lot per se about McMahon more about the business and just how he generally directed it. A lot of this is not to do with his personal life, but it does have those little snippets to give you a little bit of background on what's going forward here. Uh, They were talking about the wrestlers and the schedule they had leading to the painkillers and the other vices that they had steroids, which hint, hint, that'll be coming up here pretty quick. Uh, they talked about the situation where uh, Jesse Ventura was trying to start a union just prior to uh, WrestleMania 2. And as much as Hogan and uh, Hogan and McMahon tried to deny it, Tony Atlas point blank said, yeah, you Hogan stooged out uh, Ventura and then McMahon proceeds to pull everybody one by one separately into a room and says there's this meeting here about this union right if you show up you're fired so that tells you what kind of control Vince was having over his world and like I said earlier it's about you know any situation he could control he's always been uh, somewhat exemplary at it doing that for himself here then they got into the evolution of Wrestlemania Wrestlemania 2 coming from three sites Admitting that it was absolutely horrible, the idea of having that after. uh, Just because of the lack of technology at that point. We could talk later about whether it would be feasible now. But Then they got into the the WrestleMania 3, which in here it was openly admitted that uh, there was only 78,000 at uh, Mania. In many respects, you'll never know what the real number was for that show. Uh, the fact that Andre was that hurt and the fact that he was able to come back with that many people. And he he was actually convinced by McMahon by going to the uh, Princess Bride movie on the set and just telling him, look, I need you for a run here because uh, we're going to draw 93,000 people, blah, blah, blah. Interesting interesting little tidbits but a lot of stuff we already know already this is the part of this is the second part of the show where we're starting to slowly morph into all the stuff we already know about uh we get into the hulkamania area and uh we're learning that a lot of the stuff like was actually vince giving the words to hogan for most of his promos like everybody's thinking hogan was hogan's that crazy to say everything that he did no that was pretty much Vince telling him what to do. They were showing a lot of uh, backstage stuff but with McMahon telling Hogan and Hogan producing the promo and whatnot. Uh, so it it tells that it's a real vi- vision of Vince of what's going on here. And uh, from there, Hogan was starting to talk about how he was thinking about leaving. Well, Vince was telling the story about how he thought Hogan was leaving he was getting uh, he wanted to go to hollywood he wanted to start doing uh movies and whatnot so hogan just turned around and said we'll make a movie and apparently they showed up in a i i think they went uh to vince's place for a weekend and they created the movie no holds barred which you know only three people saw and two of them were zeus it it kept uh it kept things going here that the real change in uh, WWE was around WrestleMania 6 when the Warrior beat Hogan. Warrior wasn't the guy, which 
I, I think after after the fact, we're sort of grateful that he wasn't the guy in many ways, just for, because of who the guy that became. But that's a whole different documentary altogether. And then uh, from there, they went on to about the story about Slaughter and Hogan and Mania 7. And they completely lied about how the story was set up, which doesn't really surprise me whatsoever. They omitted the fact that they were supposed to do the L.A. Coliseum and the fact that they sold so few tickets that they uh, ended up having to move it to the L.A. Sports Arena. And they just talked a lot about the downfall of the WWF's the ticket sales, the attendance, the everything that happened with the slaughter storyline. And they, they blame it on the storyline itself, which I don't think anybody wanted to blame Hogan on it. So uh, from there start, the, they start talking about the steroid trial, what was involved, the fact that Vince had to go for it, that it was an actual, you know, witch hunt against him and whatnot. And, uh, they start talking about a few of the scandals that have been going through here because you got the steroid trial coming up and then at the same time he has the WBF that he's just starting to get running and he's like yeah well this doesn't look really good right now yeah. and then uh, one of the biggest things that they brought up in terms of this whole steroid trial and like I said when it, when it comes to McMahon speaking on this thing I've been taking about 12 14 pounds of salt on this when uh, they talk about the release of the steroid trial and the information on that and then there was this sh Hulk Hogan on uh, Arsenio Hall was there and uh, they talked about how Vince told Hulk just confess and say that you're you did take steroids but it doesn't matter now because you're not doing them anymore and you're just trying to get clean and Hogan just went up there and deny, 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 which, all right, well, I'm sorry. That's just not the way we could go with it here. But, and, and it turned out to be a very bad light on Hogan. And he, Hogan even admitted after that it was a very bad choice for him. And then uh, they started getting into the, what Hogan thinks was a witch hunt by uh, New York Times reporter Phil Munchnick. Uh, and Phil just talked about what kind of dirtbag McMahon was in many ways. So you could see where the ire of anger comes in and whatnot in this situation. Just trying to, just trying to set the seeds up for what's going on here. That where all this stuff is coming from. And then they're, t then they talked about uh, Superfly Snuka and the overall true eating of women in wrestling here. Like, basically, they said women were considered things in wrestling at that time, not people. Just toys to be used as as needed. They talked about the Wendy Richter and the whole situation with uh, the title and whatnot, which we'll come back to, I do believe, at the start of episode three here. And then, uh, then they brought up the Ring Boy scandal, which Munchnik uh, brought up a lot. For those that didn't know... Um, there was a situation where uh, ring boys were uh, ring boys who were people who set up the ring uh, were hired to come out, come down and help out. They're usually young guys, a lot of them under eighteen, just want to help out and do it and make the make basically come sh see the show and be be all great about that. But it ends up that uh, a few of the uh, WWE officials. And the one they named per se, which later got, they were told that it, this person was involved, Pat Patterson, who was the famous first Intercontinental Champion, Vince's right-hand man and whatnot. Everybody in the documentary said that, she, that he had nothing to do with it, but there was a vice president who came in and made advances on these kids. And nothing was done about it. Nah. Yeah, there's your first, there's your next little issue. And then, of course, uh, there was another uh, talk show, Donahue, that they were on where Vince was getting lambasted from all angles about everything. Then they briefly went into the Rita Chatterton uh, 
a sexual assault case where Reader Chatterton uh, sued WWF because Vince was making unwanted advances to which Vince replied that they were all consensual. We'll get back to that later on. Uh, yeah, we're, and it got to the point where one thing they showed just before just before getting to the steroid trial, Vince had a a neck issue. He didn't really need to get into the uh, get into a neck brace or didn't need surgery on it, but he did it just so he could get into a neck brace for the trial to try to get some sympathy. So he is the showman to the end here. Therefore, there, he started talking about the end of Hulkamania, the end of the Hulk in WWE, the start of WCW uh, getting into the mainstream, and we were wrapping up with uh, Eric Bischoff doing his trip down to th- doing Thunder in Paradise and the signing of Hulk and getting that all set up so that uh, WWE has a legit enemy. That's where they started... That's where they ended that episode off and they started to, uh, they're starting to get into the fact that, you know, the the Monday Night Wars and whatnot, we're going to get into that here a little bit. But that's the end of episode two there. To me, it was just a very, a very brief look at some of the whole garbage that Vince did at that time, so... This is, hey, Mass Keaton, this is a Netflix documentary that dropped today. It is six episodes. Uh, it is available wherever you can get Netflix. So definitely check it out here. We're doing a, we're on episode three. We got four more to go here. And yeah, it is a very deep and powerful. Uh, I, I think it's deep. I don't think it's as deep as it could be. But like I said, off top of the show, they're in a rough time right now. So in terms of you don't want to do it before things are proven, there, there's a lot of speculation at the end of this show. So thank you for the coverage explain. Yeah. Like simply put, I mentioned this earlier, if they, and we'll get to it at the end here very quick. If, if they would have gone a little deeper into it at the end of the show and started making claims that ended up not being true, probably would have been a slander lawsuit coming out after this so like i said i wish they would have waited a little bit to do this but we'll get to that here in a little bit let's get to episode three here and this one started i was mentioning earlier about wendy richter and the influence that she had in the women's division and the fact that this one was called screw job i wonder where we're going on this one uh wendy richter uh Ended up, uh, she didn't want to drop the title, uh, according to Vince. So she set up a match with the Black Spider, quote unquote. And they showed the quick cover and uh, shoulder was only down at one. They called one, two, three, changed the belt. And it was Fabulous Moolah underneath the gears, underneath the uh, spider gear. And it was just the way to, you know, end that situation. Then they... uh, then they turn back to the steroid trial and Hulk Hogan on the stand. Like originally when they investigated Hulk, Hulk was saying about all these things about that he took steroids and whatnot. And it was Vince that, you know, sort of helped out with that. Like he didn't hand it out, but he sort of allowed it. Hogan turned a complete 180 on the stand and just literally said, uh, no, Vince McMahon didn't tell us to take steroids. No, Vince McMahon did not uh, did not force us to take steroids, did not tell us where to get steroids. And basically at that point they had no case. And McMahon was let out of it because of the situation. Then from there they start talking about the new generation and who's going to be, who they were trying to get to push to get to that spot. And they were talking about the Lex Express and how Lex Luger just couldn't make up for it in that position. And Lex tried. Like, he just didn't have that over-the-top charisma or the -the over-the-top wrestling that was able to do it. So from there, they went and talked about Razor Ramon, Diesel, Shawn Michaels, and then they came up with Bret Hart. Because Bret, let's face it, Bret was the guy 
that carried that new generation. He didn't have as much charisma, but he, his wrestling made up for it. And that was a big deal to uh, Vince because he needed somebody who did not look like he was one of those roided up, roided up guys that the rest of them had. So then they, so from there they went to they started talking about WCW and uh, they've signed Hogan. They talked about signing uh, Savage. They talk about getting all these uh, getting all these ex WWE guys to sign. And uh, Bischoff came up and talked about how Ted Turner gave him the the time slot for the Monday Night War to get the war started. And uh, one interesting thing I saw was uh, if you guys go back to the Attitude Era and have you ever watched the uh, parody shows talking about the Nacho Man or the Huckster or Scheme Gene, USA is actually the one who stopped them from doing that. They had the uh, director of live content on the, uh, on the documentary at this point and basically said, yeah, we... We like Ted. We didn't want any of this stuff going up. And that's essentially what killed those skits. Thank goodness. Sorry, that's my own personal thing here, but I just found them. They're, they're funny, but tasteless. I You got to get a little more taste when you're doing stuff, right? And then uh, from there, they go on to the curtain call. If you don't remember the curtain call, it's when... Uh, at a Madison Square Garden show, the the final match was between Shawn Michaels and uh, Diesel in a cage. Then following the match, Razor Ramon and uh, Triple H came in, and they all did a big group hug in the ring. And then they brought up uh, different people, like there was Brett, there was Taker, there was uh, a few of the other, like uh, Bruce Pritchard was very pronounced through this story and i'm gonna to get to him at the end oh my you want to talk about backpedal um they were all talking about how there were two different reactions backstage one as in all right it this world's changing and they're changing with it then there's the old school guard who, and they started talking about kayfabe and how kayfabe was ruined that night so From there, they talked about how Hunter was going to be the one to eat shit and like it. That's the famous quote that both Triple H and Sean McMahon, uh, Vince McMahon gave. And uh, Hunter tried to justify... The one thing about Hunter is he did try to justify the current call to Vince and just tell him, look, this is the way things are happening these days. That The world's changing right now. People don't think everybody's a specifically a good guy or a bad guy and whatnot. And of course, Vince wasn't having it. And you know, the results that happened out of there, which necessarily isn't exactly the worst thing in the world. So they talk about the growth of the WCW at the hand of WWF and uh, Vince's response to all that. And then uh, Vince's response to what happened, like basically he just said, look, they we Vince's response was basically he didn't think it was fair that they were poaching his top talent even though he, that's exactly what he did in the territory days to clean out the uh the other promotions in the indie scene so he was taking a little bit of task to that but you know when you're trying to get somebody to work with you you're not going to jab too hard I think that's where that is. So from there, I don't want to go over it because it's like a 400 million time. We'll, we'll hear from it. The screw job, the, the uh, Montreal screw job. They talked about the whole story, about what happened and the fact that everybody was in on it, but Brett, but so pretty much is where it went. And we finally got a real answer to what the punch was. Vince said he just stood there and let him punch. No, it looked like they Vince actually tried to lock up with uh with Brett. And just as everybody was trying to break things up, um Brett managed to get uh Shoyuka type uppercut in on uh Vince and managed to knock him out right there. So 
And he came back with a Shiner the next day, so that makes a lot of sense at that point. And that's pretty much where we end on uh, episode three. So basically, you're looking at that turning point. One of the biggest uh, turning points in wrestling was the screw job, because that was where the creation of the, the Mr. McMahon character essentially came from here. And then basically episode four, and like I said, these middle episodes are more stuff that people who grew up in the attitude, they already know this stuff. So it's this is for a very common group of people. Episode four was called Attitude. Uh, he first talked off right off the bat about how Jerry Graham was his favorite wrestler growing up and the one that trained him early and uh, ended up uh, the dan the walk that Vince McMahon had came from uh, Jerry Graham and watching him do his work. He was a 50s wrestler, 50s, 60s wrestler that took uh, Vince around. Of course, he's going to take him around. He's the boss's kid, so... So, of course, he's going to be nice to him. And then he started to talk about getting into the character of Vince McMahon. And basically, he'll take anything that happens and he'll turn it into heat. Which, uh, you're talking about the uh, creation of DX as well. And the fact that they were about ready to be get pulled. The plug being pulled a few times. But, once again, just talking about the character of DX. And then... The discovery of uh, Steve Austin and then a very uh, I'm sort of weird out of place here, but they were talking about the thought of ECW and just showed a bit of video on ECW and Paul Amon was there explaining the culture of ECW. And basically Vince just turned and said, that's fascinating. Anyway, I don't know what the hell that was. Uh, talked about the Mike Tyson uh, being part of WrestleMania 14 which grew into the McMahon-Austin rivalry immediately following. And in my notes here, I literally have very basic episode. And for the most part at this point, it just felt like that. But then he starts getting, Vince starts getting a little bit into himself here. As he starts talking about how his roots of fighting as a kid all the time. For a lot of people that don't know, he did have to go to military school, a boarding school. Um... claims that everything that he dislikes uh he he hates uh he hates every situation that comes up that that he can't control so that's why he got into so many fights before vince says that he and the character are different him and Vin and mr mcmahon are two different people everybody every expert they brought up right after that nope just flat out just nope nope he's the same he's the same just turned up to 11 he's the same guy but nobody said that they were different which i found very telling as we move on here then they started talking about the ascension of the rock and you know rock's got to put himself over here and whatnot so uh good on the rock for you know getting his 10 minutes of fame in here uh they tried so Vince came up and he talked about how this product that he had was supposed to be family friendly. And I, where people could start saying where this documentary was being a little salacious is as Vince is talking about how he wanted his product to be family friendly and go along with all the, uh, all the details of, you know, we want kids a part of this. They start showing all the parts that don't belong to a family friendly show with the uh chop your pp and uh the uh exploitation of women and all that stuff which we'll get back to here in a second actually we'll get to it right now trish actually comes in and talks about how the women were in a certain position they weren't there to wrestle and thinks sable was the uh was the first person to be the example of that bringing it in not not in any bad way she was putting sable over completely for what she was about to do and then we got into a real tough situation for me personally they were talking about owen hart they talked about the situation they talked about his death uh they talked about vince's decision to keep the show going which for all of us ugh, don't 
let, let's just face it. I think all all the wrestlers were basically being pushed out there to continue going. Ba- I believe Jarrett was actually, you know, they were pushing him aside while they were wheeling Owen out of there. So be that where it may on that one. Uh, they talked about the lawsuit from Martha Hart and the fact that uh, WWE was cleared of any wrongdoing because it was a defect in the equipment even though uh, the equipment was found to be the improper equipment later for the uh, for the job. It wasn't the job that should have happened. They said it was default from the manufacturer. So there were lawsuits all around. And basically from there, it just went to a black screen where uh, everybody said all the lawsuits were settled with Martha Hart, with the, um, the company, with the harness, and all that. So that's where it's episode four ended. And you can tell where uh, this is starting to lean a little bit. And this is where, if you start learning a little bit more about Vince, this is where it starts getting a little bit uncomfortable for me here. And I'm just going to quickly interject. If you haven't, uh, if you want to check out How To Wrestling, How The Number Two In Wrestling, it's made by one of the guys from OSW Review, Kevin Mahan and his wife. Uh, they uh, they actually learn about wrestlers, and they actually did one on Vince McMahon. And if you listen to it, you can learn about the the incest, like we're going to get into here. And I really don't know if we want to. This is this is going to be a. I'll be very brief and very blunt about it, so we can move on real quick. But uh, we start doing that, and then if you start seeing that, you start understanding what's going on here. So. Anyway, let's get to episode five. And it's titled Family Business. So it starts with Heyman talking about the abuse that Vince had as a kid from his stepfather who beat him and apparently his mother who was incest with him. I, I'm just going to go with that and just let it run. Uh, Shane, t- Shane was talking about his career and Steph talks. Steph comes in talking about... This is the early part of their careers they're talking about here. Uh, back basically uh, during the Attitude Era, some of the interviews that they did. Uh, and they were talking about the old uh, Stephanie wedding. Uh, the whole wedding scenario when he was getting married to tw- to uh, Test. They got uh, the fact that Triple H got to hang out with Steph so much. And Vince always tried... Vince said he always tried to push Steph towards Triple H in terms of a personal relationship, but Shane was always against it. And then uh, from there we get uh, we get talking about the marriage and everything going on there. The, five days before they got married, first of all, Vince McMahon wanted to put. Triple H and Stephanie's wedding on pay-per-view. Which, yeah, Steph said no, no, and fuck no, which I completely understand. So that five days before their wedding, that was the infamous No Mercy 2003 where they had the father-daughter I quit match. Where uh, Vince uh, took on Stephanie and ended up choking her out in there, so... But then from there, they go on to talk to uh, Linda McMahon about about uh, what she was doing there. She was willing to do anything for business, but hated being on TV, which sort of makes sense because every segment she did just... It was very basic and very straightforward, so we'll leave it at that. And then the affair story with Trish, and then they had to bring it up. They brought up the Bark Like a Dog incident where uh, Vince made her bark like a dog to uh, save her job basically and then right after that they showed the part about how Vince was forcing her to undress in the ring they didn't show the part about uh, Shane coming out for the save but I don't really think it needed to be there and then uh, Sable being interjected into everything after everything that's been done just sort of talked about how Sable was an example of it didn't matter if you got fired if you can make me money we will let you be a part of this group here so 
Um, let me quickly switch over here because we got about five minutes till the uh, start of Dynamite here. So, um, then they started talking about uh, the WWF Casino and the WWF World Restaurant. They talked about the death of the the uh, final Nitro. Then they got into the XFL. Bob Costas absolutely rips it apart. This stuff is all stuff we already know. And from there, it goes to the uh, Bob Costas interview with McMahon. Then they start talking about uh, the lawsuit with uh, the World Wildlife Fund and how they had to drop the name WWF. And they just finish off this episode talking about Oh, we still got a little bit to go here. We got Hogan and Rock talking about WrestleMania 18. They're talking about Bischoff's uh, debut. Stone Cold's walk-off. One thing I found interesting is Austin did a lot of backpedaling on this episode. He said his walk-off was mainly due to injuries, not due to... Uh, not to, not as much due to creative differences. Then they talked about Vince McMahon's Ruthless Aggression promo, and this is Match Club where Cena appears. Talk about his first match. Parallels himself to the creation of Mr. McMahon's character, sort of the way that he had to... Uh, he had to create himself just out of, out of nowhere with a... Tank himself down to 11 and whatnot. Then they got into some of these other stupid parts here where they're talking about the Katie Vick uh, storyline, which is ugh, at the best times. The lesbian program with Trish that they were supposed to have. And, and one month later, uh, that's when Mickey James won the women's title in uh, at WrestleMania. Hey, Vic, good to see you here. We're just going through the Vince McMahon doc here. I had a dynamite here. It's a little tough. <laughs> uh, they were talking about the possible incest program with, uh, with Stephanie wanting to be... She have Vince to be the kid, and then, uh, then, then Shane. It's like, ugh. Confused. Well, Shane was always confused about what role he actually had after a while there. So, and then talking about getting like Shane was actually talking about getting rid of Vince earlier. Which, I'll be honest, if Shane would have got rid of Vince right where he said he was going to in the early 2010s. That might have saved a lot of points about uh, about WWE and where they went in the late 2010s. But the one thing that sort of looked apparent in this documentary is the last minute, minute and a half ended up being uh, produced in post where uh, they ended up create, talking about a lot about stuff that's coming up in episode six here. Now, episode six, Vince talks Hey, folks, uh, Editor Mike here. Uh, I went through and checked out what we talked about with season episode six of uh, the McMahon documentary here. And because we got tied up, uh, getting tied up to time with uh, AEW Dynamite, we didn't give a real chance to really go through episode six and give a final summary of the show that well. So I figured I'd come back and post and... Uh, Come back and we record something here for you guys a little bit more thorough about what happened here. So, so yeah, we get to episode six, the finish, and this one seems to be the one that's most important to people that uh, may be more be more knowledgeable about the wrestling business and not just the casuals that don't know a lot about the background. Up to this point, we've been pretty much fed everything that we already know when it comes to uh, wrestling scenarios and whatnot. But episode six starts out with Vince trying to explain that he's different between his character and his person and nobody really can figure that out here. They start out talking about his relationship with Donald Trump, which... If you're watching this as it's being released in 2024, you can realize that that's a little strenuous and a little polarizing, to say the least. And then from there, they uh, started talking about uh, 
the angle where Vince was going to get into a car and then he blew himself up and how that had to be diverted, ended, completely canceled after the death of Chris Benoit. And they talked about the whole, how they made a tribute show for him and then found out what the problem was. Then uh, Chris Lewinsky enters the uh, story here. Uh, he was interviewed for this, and he talks about how CTE can be a major factor and how chair shots are getting uh, outlawed and how things are starting to get a little bit more safer now. But at the time, it was absolutely ridiculous. Uh, Vince was trying to say that it was a work on what happened with Benoit. However, as he's saying this, they're showing video of Benoit getting dumped on his head numerous times, which obviously was there just to uh, say thank you, but no thanks, you're not. Nobody's feeding, nobody's listening to what you're feeding here. But And then the line that really set me off here on this episode more than anything else, you have uh, Steve Austin come on. And he turns around and says, well, I've been dumped on my head before and I don't have those. I don't believe CTE exists. I'm not a CTE guy. Wow. I, I don't have many more to say. Wow. I'm glad that, you know, you're looking about all this uh, information and just, ah, it didn't happen to me. It didn't happen. <sighs> lost a lot of respect for Austin after that that comment so uh, leave, I'll leave that at that I don't need to expand more on that they start talking about Test and other wrestlers dying young but Vince and a lot of his closest allies were blaming it on the recreational drugs and steroids that were prevalent at that time not necessarily the CTE or any actions that were taken Take that as you will. Everything so far has just been deflect, deflect, diverge. Anything that isn't comfortable and doesn't put McMahon in a great light, it's been deflect, 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 however they can. And I, I will give Booker T some credit. He doesn't want to see what the future holds for a lot of these athletes with the way that they have to push themselves right now. And in many ways, it feels like they're going to have to to produce an entertaining product. So... I can see where Booker T is coming from here and hopefully it, things lessen out a little bit. Then Cody Rhodes comes in and talks about how the pro when how the product moved from a TV 14 to a PG 13. And then just talking about how there's a change in demographic, how the fans are not appreciating the product the same way that they were before uh, because of the lack of not to put words in his mouth here, but more of the extreme stuff. I'm not talking about ECW per se. I'm talking about the violence, the the extra stuff that we've been dealing with here before. So, And then they started talking about the rise of the women's evolution, and I was actually surprised that Steph didn't take full credit for it. I think Steph's getting a lot worse rap than she, she deserves on a lot of this, but a lot of it is... When it, when it comes to her actions with Vince, it seems like everything's a little bit more... Vince is telling her to do this, and you have to do this, which I get it. He's the booker. But it seems like Steph was a little pandering at this point here. She talks about the giving the fans credit for the Give Divas a Chance hashtag, which I believe that was more AJ Lee and Nikki Bella that were pushing that rather than... Uh, Steph or anything like that so whatever works there then they were talking about the uh, Shane McMahon return to uh, WWE waiting I believe it was 2016 2017 uh, talking about what he would do for the business and uh, they talked specifically about what he was doing in uh, 2001 uh, the King of the Ring match with Kurt Angle they showed highlights of Shane getting knocked off by Big Show, by Steve Blackman, and a whole bunch of 
very crazy segments there. But it almost felt like Shane could never figure out what he's supposed to do in terms of his role, in terms of the family, in terms of all that. So then from there, they uh, start talking about father figures and rest. Like Vince was a father figure to everybody. And it sort of ties in here to what was going on with Shane here because they were talking about the the leadership structure in the 2010s and how uh, Shane's plans were different than what Vince's plans were. Like, I honestly feel the way things are going right now and the way things have changed post, I think we would have had a lot better product overall if Shane would have been able to take over his position just like his dad did way back uh, years ago. Things needed to move on and he needed to move on and Shane was trying to do that. The only difference is uh, Vince was willing, Vince Sr. gave Vince Jr. a work to pay off agreement on that. Uh, Vince Jr. was never going to do that. That way he could keep it keep it himself but i digress here uh it, it it ultimately leads to the reason why shane left and then shane temporarily came back and who knows if he's going to get involved in wrestling in the future that's another discussion for another day on another topic here but now the last half hour of the uh, documentary here pretty much talks about all the allegations that have come up now and, you know, a lot of people give uh, Dave Meltzer a lot of crap about stuff, but I will give him credit on one very good point here. More often than not, when there was these accusations that were unfounded, according to Vince, he would attack the lawyers that had presented him and, you know, slander and all that stuff and going, going through all the rigmarole. Never did. Never did on this one. The, uh, the accusations against uh, McMahon, Laurinaitis, WWE, he hasn't attacked any reporters because, you know, literally ugh, that just didn't go over well. Let's put it that way. And just he's walked himself into a corner. I don't think he's going to be able to get out of it. But that's here, here nor there. We'll, we'll have to see how things go here. Now then going into the lawsuits and the breakdown of everything here. And he feels, Hulk Hogan feels that WWE needs, needs Vince. Vince can't work on his own, which I think very early at this point, it's been proven wrong, which is pretty much everything for Hogan. But once again, I digress. The one thing that a lot of the reporters that are on, on the show talked about is the fan apathy over all this. Like, for everything that happens, there's no big outrage by the fans. They just want to see wrestling. And that was one of the more disheartening comments, but frankly, one of the most true ones for the fact that the fans cheered Vince McMahon the day that he stepped down and came on SmackDown to get that one last goodbye. Or when it came to the accusations, he came out and, you know, everybody cheered him in the arena. It's a lot of fan apathy about all this stuff. So then they talked about the McMahon return, Stephanie resigning on the same day, setting up the WWE sale. And at this point, uh, I think uh, Bruce Pritchard really started to show his colors because he started attacking the documentary, saying that there was only one side of Vince and there was, it's disgusting how everything's looking and he repeatedly pumps Vince's tires through all this. Then they start talking about the Netflix deal and how everything's just keep pumping along here. Then they started again to a few specifics on the Janelle Grant lawsuit, which there's a couple things that really disturb me about this. Number one, well, first of all, this is the first time I think anything formal has listed outside of news reports that Brock Lesnar was involved 
it, it is in the report, but they sort of took a little bit of a focus to it. Not a lot, but enough to make it matter in this case. And then they also, I, I would have to say the most disgusting thing about it was the mention that adult toys had names of wrestlers that were being used in this situation, which I think it's the best way to put it. I don't want to go any further into that. Let's just keep moving on here. We got the resignation from uh, Vince. Uh, basically, I, I honestly feel it's one of those, you either resign or we're going to fire you. So he just did that. And we went from there. Then the last thing that really hit me about this was they actually brought up Ashley Mazzaro and the whole, she was, she threatened that she was uh, raped in Kuwait and WWE never dealt with anything. And uh, yeah, just that horrible situation overall. Now they're starting to get to the point of the, documentary where they're trying to wrap things up here and they're talking about how wwe is really flourishing now that vince is gone and i i don't think anybody can doubt that Vin, that wwe is becoming a better product with vince not around it's never gonna get to the heights that it ever was but it definitely is going to be uh in a good position here and then they wrap it up with uh asking everybody about the question of the vegas the legacy of Vince McMahon where everybody has such a hard time to come up with a definition of who Vince McMahon is. Cause I don't think a lot of people really know. And even after this documentary, we have an idea, but we don't really know. Except for Tony Atlas. He just t turns around and says, yeah, he's a tale of two men. He was a promoter that would do everything for you when you needed something, and then when you didn't, he would, yeah, do awful, awful things. And it almost feels like throughout this documentary, one of the biggest points is McMahon is trying to cover up his character by his character, if you uh, can figure things out that way. But all in all, this documentary here, like, it was very well done. I I give it full credit for everything that it did. I would say if you're not very informed on Vince McMahon and the whole subject involved with this, I would definitely check the whole thing out. If you are familiar with wrestling and wrestling's past and all that, I would say episode one, episode two, unless you're a historian, I would check those out. And then episode six. Three, four, five is mainly talking about WWE more so than, than Vince. There are some dicey situations, but you can sort of uh, piece your way through those without much of a headache here. But did I like the documentary? It's an uncomfortable watch, but it's a good watch. My personal feeling on this, though, is if they would have been given another six months before having to release this, like once the federal investigation goes through and they can get some more tangible, you're going to get arrested or you're going to, uh, you're completely innocent, which let's face it, that's never going to happen. But if he gets arrested, it goes to jail you can go a little bit more in depth on a lot of this stuff compared to what they were able to do on this documentary here today. Cause frankly, if you try to push that boundary right now, if everything gets cleaned up, there is a very high chance that McMahon could sue them for uh, slander and trying to disparage his name. If these things are proven not guilty, I'm not going to say innocent cause I'm sorry, there's too much smoke not to be fiery or somewhere, but I would uh, definitely have to uh, tell people if they want to if they want to watch a documentary about Vince to learn a lot about it. Don't watch through the middle part. The middle part just is fluff. It it really doesn't say a lot about what's going on with McMahon himself. It's more about giving you. 
a little bit of context to see where the atmosphere was in WWE at that time. Do I think I wasted six hours of my life watching this? No. Do I think it could have been compacted a lot more to make it a lot better? Yes. Do I think they're going to make another episode of this once everything goes down? Most definitely. But with that, I um, think that's going to wrap it up here for this uh, breakdown of the Vince McMahon documentary. Do us a favor. Make sure you subscribe to the channel here. Give us a thumbs up. Comment your thoughts on the whole McMahon controversy situation here. I know it's a very sensitive situation for a lot of people, but to me, it, it it's something that needs to be brought up. And just like they were saying with the uh, lack of mainstream media to cover it, if we aren't going to cover it, no one will kind of thing. So let's, uh, let's get the word out. Let's make sure that everybody hears what's going on here with the situation. And let's get people to watch this documentary because... I always love watching a good wrestling documentary, even if it is uh, something as deep and as uncomfortable as this. And also, let me know in the comments if you want to see me do another review like this on whether it be an arc, whether it be uh, a theory, whether it be some kind of story about something that happened in wrestling, something that's going to happen in wrestling. Let me know if you want me to do some of these breakdowns because I'm looking to expand our uh, content here on uh, the Backbreaker Gaming or Backbreaker Gaming and the Backbreaker Video Channel. So, but with that, folks, just remember: be part of the solution, don't be part of the problem. And we'll see y'all here next time on the Backbreaker Video YouTube channel. Take care, everybody.